Unit 4, Research Methods. Section 1, Validity and Reliability. Okay, so today's screencast is looking at internal validity, which is one of the types of validity that you need to be aware of for research methods. We're going to look at what internal validity actually is. We're going to look at why it is important, and we're going to look how we can actually prevent it. So, for example, uh, we're going to look at a research project uh, which will help us guide our way through describing what internal validity actually is. And we're going to look at the effect of creatine on sprinting performance. So creatine is an over-the-counter supplement and we're going to investigate whether or not uh, it affects sprinting performance. So as a group of researchers we first started by conducting a pretest to get a baseline sprint score for all of our subjects. And we did the 30 meter sprint test. We then got our subjects to do four weeks of training with creatine and then we got them to do another sprint test at the end of that four weeks to see if there was a difference in performance and after we analyzed the results we found there was a significant improvement in sprint time so our sprinters were able to improve their sprint time by taking creatine however what we must do as researchers is we must ask ourselves whether or not the results that we found can be believed have we found the truth so in this case, we're asking ourselves, have we found the truth? Are they valid? And today we're going to ask whether they are internally valid. Okay, so let's look at what internal validity actually means. Internal validity is essentially the extent at which the results can be attributed to the treatments used in your study. What this essentially means is that in this case, we've administered um, creatine and seen an improvement in sprint performance. So the question is, that improvement in sprint performance, is that purely down to the creatine itself? Or was there anything else that could have added to the actual um, result? So it's really important that as a researcher, we can be confident that the only reason we're seeing an improvement in sprint time is because of the creatine. And it's not because of any, uh, anything else that was happening in our study. So we found a significant improvement. We need to know whether that improvement is true and whether there was anything else that could have caused that improvement other than the creatine. And these other factors are known as intervening factors. Okay, so we're going to discuss the different intervening factors here that could have influenced our results. So the first one is called the placebo effect. Now you might have heard of a placebo before, um, but I'm just going to use an example to explain what it means. So we're going to look at a study by Polo et al. in 2008. Now this particular study uh, got a group of subjects to do some uh, weightlifting, lift as much weight as they could, uh, and then they gave them a caffeine pill. And what was shown was that subjects uh, actually increased the amount of weight they could lift. Now that's not really surprising because caffeine is a stimulant and we know it has that effect on the muscular system. But what's interesting about this study was that whilst the subjects thought they were taking a caffeine pill, they actually weren't. They were actually taking a placebo pill. Essentially in this case they were just taking an empty pill. It had nothing in it. But they were told that it had caffeine in it and that it would improve their performance. So what we're seeing here is that subjects were almost psychologically tricked into thinking that this pill would improve their performance. And it actually did. Even though there was nothing in the pill that would actually cause their performance to improve. So what's a placebo? A placebo is, whether, is, is a way of assessing um, that whether the effect that we're seeing is purely down to an actual treatment or whether or not there's an actual psychological improvement. People can actually be psychologically tricked into doing better just by thinking that they're taking something. So let's revert that back to the study we looked at earlier with our creatine study. So the question we have to ask ourselves here is whether or not people actually got quicker after four weeks, not because the creatine actually made them quicker, but whether they just thought they would be quicker because they were taking this magic creatine powder and they thought that that would actually make them better. And so that's a real problem here because it might actually just be the psychological improvements um, that caused that increase in sprint time and actually the creatine had no effect at all. So we've really got to work out how we can get around that problem. Okay, so how can we prevent this? Well, what we can do is set the study up in a very similar way, um, but this time, rather than having just one group training, like we did here, 
what we can do is we have two groups. One group taking the creatine as normal, but then we also have a second group that do the training with a placebo. And what we're looking at here is that in theory, group two shouldn't improve their performance. They're just taking a placebo, uh, it doesn't have anything in it, um, and so therefore um, their results shouldn't improve. And if we see an improvement in the creatine group, we know it's purely down to the creatine and not a psychological effect. And in this case, we have something called a blind setup. So the subjects obviously wouldn't know which one they were taking. If they knew they were on the placebo, then it's a pointless exercise. So we have to make sure that subjects are not told whether they're taking the creatine or the placebo. Okay, so let's talk about our second intervening factor. Um, this is called the learning effect. And what this is, is um, it's basically the more that we conduct a test, the better people get at it. So a great example of this is the bleep test. The first time people do this test, they tend to score quite poorly because it's quite an unusual test. It requires uh, 180 degree turns, which some sportsmen aren't used to. Um, it requires pacing to the beeps. Um, and certainly subjects get caught out the first time they do it. So what we might have is, if we do a test of a beep test, and then we do it again a week later, our subjects actually might get better at the beep test, not because they've improved their fitness, but because they've learnt how to do it better. And that's a real problem in research. So if we go back to our example, there is a danger that our subjects have actually got better um, between the pre-test and the post-test, because they've learnt how to do the sprint test better. And that's a real issue because we need to make sure that any difference in the sprint tests are purely down to the creatine, not because they've learned how to do the test better. So how can we prevent that? Well, we've got a number of options here. The first one is using a control group. So we can have a third group, and that group of subjects just do the pre and the post test. And what we're looking at here is that the control group should not improve their, uh, their speed. And that allows us to see that there's no learning effect. We can also quite simply do an habituation test, which basically is letting the subjects have loads of practice goes at the test before they actually do the research project. Which means when they do the research project, they've got nothing more to learn, and therefore any difference in their sprint scores will be purely down to the fact that the creatine has had an effect. So if we go back to our study, we can see we've still got our group 1 with creatine, we have our group two with placebo, but we've now added a third group in. And this group, as I've said before, are a control group, and they do nothing. And in theory, group three should not improve their sprint scores. If they do, then we have a learning effect, and then we can assess that that is a bit of a problem. Okay, so our last intervening factor is one of the actual subjects themselves. Now, in some cases, we can't use a placebo. And if we can't use a placebo, then sometimes subjects will know whether they're actually taking something or not. And that's where we have a big issue. Let's consider a real-life example. This is one of our BTEC research projects from a few years ago. What we've got here is uh, the effect of 90 minutes of football on shooting performance. So we had a group of uh, subjects, and what they did is they completed an accuracy shooting test. Uh, we had one group of subjects complete 90 minutes of playing football and one group just had to rest. And then we had to look at whether or not uh, their shooting scores uh, were worse or better. Now there's a big problem here because the, the subjects in group two knew that they were the control group. They knew that they were just going to be resting um, and in which case um, th they knew that. There's no way of making a placebo of a 90 minute football match. Either they played football or they didn't. Now the problem here is that there are subject effects. So for example, subjects might feel resentful that they didn't get to play the 90 minutes. They, they knew that they were just a control group, and so therefore when it came to the second lot of shooting tests, they might have just not bothered trying very hard. Or they might have been really motivated because they felt a bit done over and they didn't like the fact that they were in the control group, so actually they tried even harder on the shooting tests. So we can rate a study's internal validity by looking at all of these factors. If a study controls or prevents the intervening variables, then it has high internal validity and is very good. Conversely, we can also uh, 
rate and internal validity of a study if they didn't control it. So if, they, if a study fails to control some of these major factors, so if they don't use a placebo group, if it's relevant, they don't use a control group, they don't allow the subjects to habituate or get rid of the learning effect, um, if a study doesn't do that sort of stuff, then it has very low internal validity. And again, that's a great way of critiquing and being critical of other people's studies. And also, it's a way of looking at our own study uh, and, and working out whether or not we've done a great job or not. So why is this so important? Well, ultimately, we're trying to judge how valid or truthful a study is. So if we're looking at someone else's work, we're trying to work out whether they've actually found the right result and whether we can improve their research. But also we can look at our own research and judge how accurate we are and then consider whether or not we've done the best study we could have. Ultimately, we want to do all of this in advance. So we want to set up our study in the first place to have high internal validity. So when we get our answer, we're confident in what we found. Okay, so internal validity is all about controlling those intervening factors which could affect our research study. This way, we can be sure that our results are truthful and accurate.